Max Winters, a pulp writer in 1930s New York, finds himself drawn into a story not unlike the tales he churns out at five cents a word. Tales of a Wild West outlaw dispensing justice with a six gun. Will Max be able to do the same when he's per pursued by bank robbers, Nazi spies, and enemies from his past? This is Pulp. From Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips, and colored by Jacob Phillips. Welcome to the Comics Pals Book Club. It's a very, very Ira Glass intro there. You know, that was one of the first pieces of feedback we ever got about the show was that I sound like Ira Glass. And <laughs> I've, I've ridden that high for seven years. <laughs> I was like, I, what, what episode of This American Life are we listening to? Can I just take a, a very quick moment uh, before you move on, Kale, to show, to brag a little tiny bit about my signed copy of Pulp? Oh, Where'd you get yes. that? You know, you want to know where I got it from, Tyler? I'll tell you where I got it from. Matter of oh, fact, I'll show you. Midtown Comics. I got it from Midtown Man. Comics. Uh, wow. Sometimes that boot does taste good. <laughs> <laughs> did yes. uh, did you get the um the the process edition? Uh, I don't think so. I think this. It, is, I no. mean, it, it's yeah. how it's constructed. It's a whole. There's a regular version that you know is a hardback, but there's also uh like an. I don't think it's oversized, but it's a uh, it's a whole process book you it's got the script and like the thumbnails and the um you know how they penciled it and everything i really want that because it looked like there was a lot in it mm. uh before we get started here i wanted to know if you guys had any history with westerns mm. and in particular because i know sean is very finicky i wanted to hear his answer no Mm, great. Let's move on then. Elaborate. Yep. <laughs> in, uh, in, in any medium? Um, I mean, look, like I've seen, I saw the, uh, what was that one movie with everybody black on Netflix where there were Westerns? It was mm -hmm. a Western. I saw that. That was pretty cool. But I didn't feel like that was a Western because Westerns don't have black people. Um, and then, uh, and mm. uh, that's it. That's the only Western I think I've seen. Interesting. You never even seen anything like a, like a Django Unchained, which is like, I would still that's consider a, that Western. That's, that ain't no damn that's, Western. My man yeah, was a slave. A it is. A Western. Yeah. yeah, it's a Western. Western All is right. more more of a of a of a theme uh, than really a it's setting. Like a feeling. So, yeah, a it's genre. a feeling. A genre. That that felt like a slavery revenge movie. I mean, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. but that takes place in a Western. Yeah. Or even like Midnight yeah. Cowboy, Cowboy with uh, John Voight. That is a that is a Western as well, but it's set in New York City. I haven't seen that. Uh, actually, possibly one of the last Western. But I like Tyler, Give me four more Westerns. <laughs> um, Arizona. Um, 310 to Yuma. Uh, I was just going to name Western states. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I don't know. This full, uh, this full of dollars. Sure, Bad Marco's got it. Marco's got it. Yeah, my uncle was a huge fan of uh, uh, spaghetti Westerns, and he, we used to watch a lot of those, uh, those films. Uh, so I, I, I personally love them. Not so much in comics, but movies, big fan. Yeah. Marco, do you have like Western movie uh, soundtracks on vinyl? No. Oh, I wish. That'd be clutch, dude. Who's the real <laughs> famous? Uh, um, Is en uh, Enzo something, no? And, and Ericoni, I think. I might that be right. pronouncing that right. incorrectly. But uh, yeah, yeah, like that. That's great. Or even like stuff like uh, like there are some Japanese westerns as well, you know. Uh yeah, um, Seven Samurai. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, what's his name? I keep it's not Akira Yoshida, but that's the only <laughs> name I can come up with. You're not better than him now for that. <laughs> uh, Kurosawa. Kurosawa. Yes, Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa. Yes. Kurosawa. Yes. Good stuff. I have those movies. I haven't watched them yet. Oh, so good. Uh, awesome. my favorite is Tombstone. Kurt Russell as a lighter. Is that with uh, Val Kilmer too? Oh yeah! yeah. Oh, damn! Yeah, great film. Yep. Uh, so before we get into the meat of this, if you like this discussion, let me tell you, you're gonna like us. You can find us on Saturdays 
live on YouTube at 1015 Eastern, uh, where we talk about the trending news in comics and the movies and Lord knows whatever else. We talk about the cons sometimes. It's ridiculous. Uh, but if you like comic reviews, we also do that on Thursdays at 6 p.m. on a little show we call Pals Polls. We do that live, and the episode comes out uh, on Friday. Uh, it's, I'll be on Friday. YouTube right afterwards, but audio comes up Friday morning. Uh, Pulp was also specifically chosen by our patrons over on Patreon. And if you want to wield that kind of power on us, you can do it on patreon.com slash the comics pals. Um, and that's it. This was a cool Ed Brubaker uh, themed selection because we wanted to. There happened to be a lot of Ed Brubaker talk going on and. Do it. That's what that's what happened. Strike and, they the for, and they forced me to horse uh, to they forced me to host this episode. A horse is Maybe. an interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting slip of the tongue. I almost said vocal typo. That is not a thing. Uh this is a short book. <laughs> I was n- very surprised at how short this would be, especially for a brew baker. Mm. Yep. They've been doing this recently. I know Pulp's one of them. Um, they these are almost like criminal stories. Like these, this, this would have been like maybe two issues of Criminal, maybe three. Um, but instead, they're doing them in these like kind of just like tiny hardcovers. Yeah. Um, which, which is a, it's appreciated. I I, I like yeah, that. I mean, it's a, much sort of that, that European album format. You get a release here and there. Sometimes it's not always as. Uh, I don't know, it's not that large, and it's just like a nice consumable. I read this, you know, in a quick half hour. It just felt good. Um, the length bothered me definitely. Uh, Interesting. For yeah, that I, I, I really was looking forward to reading this, and I love Brubaker and Phillips. I've been on it since, yeah, maybe day one. I don't know, like since the beginning. I feel <laughs> sleeper um, was it whatever it was, like the first criminal. I, I, what back then. Um, and this was a good story. Um, but it just, I, right when I was like really starting to feel it, it was over. Mm. That was the, that was the big criticism I saw, um, with, with like the only criticism I saw, I, w- I was floating around looking for a little bit of information on the book and, the the only knock I saw was that its length really uh, leaves something to be desired for like more backstory, and I I found that really interesting because I didn't feel like the characters weren't fleshed out. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, Brubaker is a master at this point, especially because of the criminal books. I think like if you look at that as an exercise, right, like. He's a really, really talented writer at being able to give you the essential pieces of information about a person in a relatively short amount of time. You know, we always talk about decompression in comics. Brubaker doesn't suffer from that. He can tell a story in a quick time frame if he's got to do it. Um, it's just that if, th- like, if this were a criminal story, like you said, like if this were, you know, a couple of issues of criminal then most likely some amount of these characters would have either carried on and been seen in another volume at another time, or we would have already seen. Whereas this is all there is. And for me, because of that, it's like, uh, you know, I I wanted to know more about um, Max's daughter, like what happened with that. I was thinking about that a lot. Like I I almost wanted more of his adventures in the past he set up a lot of really interesting things. And it's not that the book doesn't pay itself off. It's just that I wanted more, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in, in particular, like the way that it, it opens with the two, him wanting to tell these smaller stories with the, the two cowboys going to Mexico and kind of like retiring. I'm like, oh, word, that's cool. And that translates to his own life. Like, I want to see that because that feels like, you know, a lot of, it seems like he's, Live these many lives. Let me see that aspect of his life. I enjoyed the length. 
Honestly, I thought that that's uh, the, the length is honestly one of my favorite parts of the book, strangely. Mm. Um, it was really refreshing for me. I uh, yeah. expected the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, especially uh, physically, sometimes you hold a book and it's just like you start seeing the length of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's just like, all right. I don't know, uh, like some of these, like when it's not like a trade where I can, you know, I know where the specific breaks are in the book, it's, it's by issue. Um, something like this, mm. it's not broken up by that. It, it's, you know, I, I kind of have to read it in one go. So knowing that it's like, all right, I, I can see the end and I, and I, I see that it's going to come to a close. It's good. And it also kind of added the tension, tension to it. Cause I was like, all right, where's this, where's this going? You know, mm. I was towards the end of the book and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, it seems like we finally got to some meat and I'm like almost at the end and I'm like, okay, all right. How is this going to end? Um, but it ends exactly how it should um, where it needs to yeah and, and i like that i think it, it's a very specifically um crafted book i think it's mm. it is the right it's like guys i swear i'm not hungry but it's like a correctly proportioned meal you know what i mean mm. um not too much not too little getting your serving Perfectly designed light lunch uh did you guys read all read physically i did actually yeah brubaker yeah. and phil's books are books i get physically yeah yeah no, I read this one digitally. Okay, yeah. I, I had no idea how long it was before I read it. Um, so when it ended, I went, oh, oh, that's it. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I guess I have an afternoon. I, I like scroll through the next page and just like blank. I'm like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, wait, what's, this is the back cover. What's going on? <laughs> I love it. The last page, even in, in print, I was like, oh, that's it. Okay, here we go. How, uh, so the, the book, you know, starts out in 1930s New York on the, uh, you know, the precipice of World War II. Um, and one of the things I found really interesting, and I don't think I've seen this before um, in any other story, I guess, is the this juxtaposition of 1930s New York and you know, the 1800s, you know, when you think cowboys and world war two, like you think those are, those are worlds apart. Yeah. Right. Really? Is it 50 years? Maybe. Uh, it's the same thing. Like, um, like, uh, we, we always learn about these things in such like isolated boxes that it feels yeah. like, Oh, they're, they're eras that then morph into other eras, but we were in that in between period. And it's like, Oh, that wasn't, that was probably like 20 years ago, you know, like, that's only a few people's lifetime. It's the same thing as when people compare uh, the the rise of of uh, things in Europe to being coinciding with the Incan Empire. It's like those things don't feel like they align, but they're happening in parallel. Like the times happen in parallel, and uh, I found that so surprising. And I think it worked really well because I wasn't expecting how close how close to home one being in New York City. And then also how close to home in terms of the, like, I thought, you know, that I can feel that a hundred years ago for World War One fine, I can feel that. But I would have thought, oh, you know, ages for uh, Westerns, for that time of that specific time of Americana. Um, you ever, you ever read Kale, the Dark Tower? Stephen oh, King? I want to. I haven't. I've been, I've meant to. Um, I've, I've recently gotten into Stephen King. So the first book is the first book is a Western. Okay. And in it, one of the central ideas is that the world has moved on. And that's a, that's a theme of the series. The world has moved on. And, and what it refers to um, it, it's a long story for the book, but the main character is your prototypical, you know, Western hero. He's Clint Eastwood in a Stephen King book. And yeah, okay. that phrase, the world has moved on, made this make sense to me because this is essentially the same character. Mm, and that's yeah. how Westerns are. It's a guy whose time has come and gone, but he's still kicking. He's still got one bullet left in the chamber and he's going to let it off. Mm. Um, and this is what that reminded me of. And so even though I don't have a frame of reference for a ton of Westerns, that phrase connected 
the Western aspect of this with the 1930s aspect of this for me. And I agree. I thought that that was an interesting um, juxtaposition. Did that, uh, did that shift bother you at all? Because I, I came into it thinking it would be a Western because of the comic, uh, the cover. I already knew because I had to write the descriptions for the Patreon. So I already oh, knew sure. the, okay. the framing device um, and I wasn't bothered by it. I once once the turn happens, like we get that first black page with Max all beaten up, which is really the end of the book, which I didn't realize. So I look back on it. Um, we're in that Western time. And then the shift happens where it's like, oh, no, this is just pulp comics or pulp, pulp books that uh, this guy is writing. And I'm like, oh, that's such a brewbaker twist to it. <laughs> like to keep it in New York and have it, you know, somewhat deal with his special interests, you know, like writing, you know, like Fatal deals with it, fade out. That's all of it, you know. Yeah. Um, criminals tackled it a bunch of times. Uh, I, I it, it, once I saw that turn, I was a little disappointed. I was like, oh, I kind of wanted a straight western. Yeah. And also, it's like, well, oh, it's Rick or he, he can do this. It's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, the um, one of the things I read was um. Sean Phillips had said he specifically wanted to do a Western. So Brubaker said, okay, I'll do my best. And it's still a noir book. And I, I think um, one of my, I guess, criticisms is that I'm not so sure that the Western part of this dude's life wasn't more interesting. Um. And if that's the case, you know, because again, like I said earlier, I found myself wanting more of that. Yeah. And, you know, we're seeing all these cool adventures and flashbacks. Meanwhile, my man's old as hell having heart attacks. Obviously, you know, there was interest there for sure. But when you have such small um, space to tell the story, giving us snippets of what's so compelling and then showing us like his slower life, sometimes I was like, eh, I think I might have wanted maybe more of the Western stuff, just because it looks so damn cool. For, for me, it was the inverse. Uh, mm. I've seen Westerns. I've read Westerns. I've played Westerns. I've played Red Dead. Um, so, like, that montage of all the stuff, it's like, all right, I've seen that. That's cool. The idea that a cowboy or, like, a bandit, I guess a bandit would be the right term for him, right? Rap, no, not a rap scallion. That's not an official term. Whatever he was. Bandit, um, yes. Yeah. He, he survived. He lived. And how did, like, and and then that that goes back to you know the time being almost hard to comprehend because like yeah if you know if that person lived during that time he could be around during you know the the you know past the turn of the century and it's like how do you how does a cowboy who knows like oh I should have died how does he keep living on and I thought that was interesting yeah I I sort of took it because I had the same thoughts on where and and initially because of the cover I thought. Oh sweet, we're gonna get a, a full on just Western story. I'm ready for this. I'm ready to see this kind of art. I'm ready to see this kind of storytelling come from these this team. And because he was a writer at the end, I then or not at the end, but it turns out he becomes a writer. I think that it I was trying to get into what is Brubaker's headspace here? Like I surely he has an he has a Western adventure. Surely he has, you know his travels down to Mexico, him escaping from the law, like all that. But I wonder what is happening in Brubaker's own life where he's contemplating his own age, his own uh, value within like this larger writing ecosystem. Uh, the, the first few pages we see, he gets basically a pay cut because, you know, other people are popping up with their own things and, and with Western stories. And he's uh, then getting replaced and so I, I wonder if there was some level of feeling there where he, now that he's in his later life, how does he reclaim some of his youth to some degree? Well, I think he's, he's commenting on not necessarily like his life experience, but the writer's life experience. Ed Rubaker is still in demand and Image lets them do, they, they literally do what they want, you know, him and Sean. Um, but not every writer gets that. And especially at that time, you know, an old man, you know, the, the eight, like he's not, I don't know how, Ed, how old Ed is probably like what? 40, late forties, early fifties. Um, I took this. Okay. 
So I, I took this guy to be a little bit older than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, without the kind of cachet that Ed Brubaker has mm. to be able to say, well, we're just going to do what we want. It's going to sell. So you don't care. Um, but then also the idea of being replaced. I mean, how, how, um, how poignant is that now with the conversation yeah. about AI with scabs AI with all that? Like, yeah, it's very poignant now. That was, that was jarring, especially reading this now, you know, talking about like uh, when they hired the, uh, the, the, the editor in chief's nephew or something. And he's like, Oh, yeah. I'll do it for, a, you know, he does it for a penny. I was like, some things never change. <laughs> Power of the dollar, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think that's the inciting incident? The uh, his replacement, and I guess sort of the heart attack that happens in that immediate vicinity. Because I feel like there were like potentially two inciting incidents that made him. I, I would consider the heart attack one because the heart attack is what kind of kicks off him talking about all the times we've di he's died. So that's when we get yeah, the information right. on his whole, you know, life story and his backstory and who he was. And that's the thing that follows him throughout the rest of the story. And ultimately what it doesn't end him, but uh, yeah, I would say it's the heart attack either that or when he meets um, what's his face. Yeah, when he meets the Pinkerton, uh, Jeremiah Goldman. Yeah, that's one of the ones I I thought of. Uh, but the other one, yeah, I think was either the first heart attack or him meeting the kid uh, who replaces him. You could say they're one the same. The yeah, they've kind of they kind of incite each other. The uh, yeah. heart attack and the intern. I thought it was also him and uh, Rosa, like his wanting to do better for her. And after, when he doesn't tell her about the heart attack, I think that's a moment where he makes a decision to keep that for himself and want to not have her worry while he tries to prep her for the rest of her life. I mean... On, on the once you bring up Rosa, I actually really liked. I mean, Rosa herself is not really a character. She's more of a uh, uh, a trait for Max in this. Um, she mm -hmm. doesn't really get much agency, which I guess is an issue. But this is a small book, and it's specifically about this one man. Um, but her his relationship with Rosa a is never named. It's never given a title. You know, he doesn't say my girlfriend. Yeah. He never says my wife. It's always Rosa. Um, and he doesn't tell her much either. Um, like he won't tell her he, you know, she, he got a heart attack. I don't even think he, I don't even think he ever even tells her about the house that he gets at the end either. Like he puts it in her name, but she's not there for it. We mm -hmm. never see him tell her that. So that whole relationship dynamic um, just kind of helps cement how much this guy does not know how to live. <laughs> Um, the fact that, you know, his actual wife and the person he refers to still as his wife, the one who died uh, from uh, influenza when he was with his old partner um, and his yeah. kids died, presumably from the same thing. Um, he still lives there, really. He doesn't know how to get past that. Um, and his relationship with Rosa or, or lack thereof actual um, intimacy, really, or, or emotional intimacy um, kind of shows, again, how like, this is almost a guy at a time in a way trying to keep up um, and losing his agency in the process, both, you know, in his job, his body's failing on him. Um, yeah. I, I like that bit of it. I also think it's a, it's a general commentary on aging. You know, sure. not everybody comes, you know, not everybody's an outlaw in their youth, but we all understand um, and the older we get, the more we understand how, you know, you sort of feel like you become less relevant in the world, to the world. Um, people walk past you. They don't care about you. They don't look at you a second time. You know, all of a sudden, you you know, you get up, you stand up and your knee pops. And now you're in a brace. and You have no idea why you got heart attacks, you got to eat broccoli, like all these things, you know, um, just just start happening in your life. 
And I can imagine that there's some rage associated with that. Um, and I, that's what I think I was able to connect to emotionally with this guy, a guy who would have shot first back in the day, Hell yeah. you know, um, and asked no questions. And revels in that, that life, you know, he writes about it still. He was like good was, at it. Yeah. It was the good old days for him. And now he has to take shit. He has to eat shit from younger men. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. Well, and he, and he even says, you know, uh, so he has this heart attack and, and, the Nazis are, you know, in the news and he's having a panic attack and he realizes I've got to make a life, uh, if nothing else, for Rosa. And at that particular moment, he sees a uh, uh, sort of a, a, a the movie theater uh, bank handoff, you know, Money to bank. an armed guard or whatever. Would have been like the Brinks truck nowadays. Yeah. 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 Um, and he realizes Oh, I know what I'm good at. And he cut, he says he says specifically, I've come up with a half cocked plan. That'll work. Yeah. And, and you know, it's not he doesn't have his faculties the way he he did. I also think he's ready to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like this is fine. This is good enough. And so if if it goes through, cool. If not. All right, that's it. I, I give him my shot. He's like a cat in his eighth life. Like, you know, he's like, I've, I've dodged. I haven't dodged bullets, but I've also dodged bullets. Um, <laughs> like, I can't, I can't keep doing it. You know, this heart attack is going to be the end of me. Um, and, and to, f- go ahead. Sorry, keep going. Uh, to, to further that point on, like, it, him being from a bygone era, when the Pinkerton stops him, it's like, yo, you would have been dead in, like, you would have been dead before you turned the corner. Because in his day, you know, he said he used to bounce. He should just get on his horse, ride off into the sunset, and he made his money. But here, he's in a city. It's a different, to different time. There's different, uh, just life is just different. You don't, you know, you can't and don't do these things anymore. And he's just like, well, surely if I come in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring back the past. But that's it. It's blown by you, dude. Mm. That was that was a a realization where, for him, I think. He wanted that last rush, but he realized he wasn't able, he wasn't going to get it in the way that he would have wanted until the the Pinkerton guy stepped in. As I was reading this, I was like, man, Brubaker and Phillips are great at doing, you know, like the one bad day thing, like the one bad day that like sets off this chain of events here, but they've done it everywhere. You know, I mean, Killer Bee Guild is a much longer thing, but that kind of starts in that way. Um Criminal, that's all criminal is. And I was like, man, if only they had gotten this team to do one of those Batman books. <laughs> Ooh. I don't you ain't get Brew Baker back to do yeah, one no, of those. Yeah, no way. Oh, he's done. I, I did like the the two motifs, the new beginning and the death, them being so counter to each other and how that would permeate throughout the story. You get it at the start with he's like, you know, this is the the third time I've almost died. And after every subsequent event that happens, you know, he looks at the, uh, he looks at the cash that's getting dropped off from the movie theater to the, the bank car. This could be a new start. He connects with the Pinkerton. This could be a new start. He's, he's looking, it, it's weird cause he's ready to die, but he's still looking for a way to advance his life. I think it's a very, um, it's a very macho, masculine, ego-driven idea to say, whatever about my life, I'm prov- I'm a provider, mm. which I think was what he was feeling like. It, do- it wasn't about his new life. It was about providing a life for Rosa. And, you know, that if he can accomplish that, he's good. Yeah, it's worth it. Especially since his wife and daughter died, and he he ostensibly failed them, right? Mm. Which I, I I like that because Brubaker has a talent for like th- this is a good guy, I guess. You know, like Max did his dirt, but it seemed to be that he was doing his dirt in order to like almost like a Robin Hood type of thing. Like 
he wasn't really like trying to rob innocent people. Right. Um, but a lot of times Brubaker's protagonists are bad guys, but there's something about them that you can find yourself in and connect to, and you can understand the rationalization that they're making. This guy's clearly making a ton of rationalizations. You're an old ass man. You can't probably get this robbery off, bro. But he has to believe that he still can the same way that he used to. All of Brubaker's protagonists always die. They always end up getting screwed over by their own hubris and desperation. So on one hand, for me, as someone who's a veteran of these stories, it's a bit well-worn. But on the other hand, I always find my way into these people. So I, I, I appreciate that about his work. I think he makes them complex. And, and he, he's, a, he's really good at making each character different and complex. There's no, I, I don't feel like I've, I've ever gotten into a book of his and been like, oh, I've seen this somewhere. Like maybe thematically. That's but... how I felt. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I like the book. I thought it was really good, but it definitely, if you've, I think if you've read a Brubaker, you can predict this a mile away. Like it was obvious he was going to, first of all, of course he was going to die. Second of all, it was obvious he was going to get betrayed um, by the 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 Pinkerton guy. Oh, you saw that coming? 150 million Yo, percent. Yo, that got me and I got mad. Because Brubaker protagonists always get betrayed because they're always dumb. They're too desperate to be smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the way he was betrayed was more novel. And we can get to that in a second. But yeah, there was a lot that was pretty... Telegraph. Paint by numbers, Brew Baker. Yeah. Even, even like even the opening. Yeah. I went, oh yeah, this is a Brew Baker. <laughs> and like, I don't know if you guys had read uh Reckless. Um similar idea, similar concept. I think I connected with that one just a little bit more because there was more meat to it. This was very brisk. But man, if you've read a Brubaker, you've read a lot of them. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. Is there a Brubaker that has a good ending, like a happy ending? Hmm. Uh, Captain America? <laughs> I, I, I'm talking about like creator own stuff. I guess it depends on what you mean by a happy ending, because you sure. could argue that this is a happy ending. Sure. Yeah, sure. Mm, not yet. I, yeah, I don't know that I would. I think it is. Because he accomplished all his goals. Yeah, he got what he wanted. And he got out on his own terms, and he did something about it. Yep. All right. I mean, sure, I he, got, he got lit up with gunfire, <laughs> but, you know, hey. Um, I So uh, the Jeremiah Goldman character, I think, is a great foil in this. Um, I almost kind of wish he would have showed up a little earlier in the book. Um, mm. But. Oh, I don't. Him also being a man out of time in a, in a completely different way. It's like they yeah. they were they were on separate sides of the law really back in their 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 golden days. Um and now because the world, the world has moved on without them in worse ways for Jeremiah, you know, with the rise of Nazi sympathizers in New York City. Um I thought that was great uh seeing them like team up um in ways and even how like Jeremiah kind of like swindles him for the mission but doesn't really um I thought that was real fun because i think when they looked at each other there was also there was some kind of like weird understanding it was like yeah we would have killed each other at one point but yeah that's not where we are now well they have that conversation where yeah. he's like oh i shot one of your guys he's like, oh that's right you know whatever and he's, he's like, like landing anyway. or some shit <laughs> yeah and he's like ah, he's a dickhead who gives a shit i hated but, that guy yeah but but that was such a that was such a like an interesting conversation because you're right that they were they would have you know been shooting at each other they would have been in a shootout they would have been caught you know in a bar somewhere a saloon somewhere you know at behind desks or something and now they're just here and they're reminiscing on people that would have otherwise been just shitty hmm. I, I i took it like you know hey cops and robbers is fun but this shit's real yeah yeah you know like like we were playing games before. Yeah, some people died. We were getting money. We were losing money, whatever. It was cool. Now, you know, the world is at stake. Yeah. We got to put all that aside. How so? Uh, 
Jeremiah talks him into doing a better heist, potentially the last heist. Um, and so they break into uh, a Nazi club, the Nazi Bund, I think it is. And uh, they quit. Well, Max quickly realizes that it's not money they're after. They're after uh, a ledger, which I I guess was all of the like the you know the accounts and the yep. you know the the paperwork for yeah. for the, the Nazi the club hitting Nazi supporters that would be out there yeah right okay yeah even better um how did that play for you guys I I thought once it ha- once the twist happened I'm like oh there's an ulterior motive but it's altruistic and because of that that played out better than oh dude he's gonna screw max over and i would have i would have been angry at that but the way that he still helps him in the end actually not even not even getting to the end but like the way he you you start to realize in the same in the same beat that max does i thought was a really good job and um i was realizing as it was happening too i'm like oh wait a minute hold on this guy was just after the money because we we're gonna hurt the nazis but he's actually thinking about hurting them in a different way in a way that will will mean more in the long run that's a big, that's a bigger way yeah. yeah in a bigger way i enjoyed the fact that uh like max doesn't freak out right away you know? yeah like he still finishes the job he's a little thrown off for it so things yeah. almost got, things got a little sloppy um but the dude's old. Like he can't. He, he even knows. Like he can't just do what he normally would have done. He probably would have just shot the dude. You know. Um, and I I like how. Uh, uh, uh what's the uh, Goldman? What's his first name? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. I like how he just tells him honestly right away. Um, which, you know, then he then he explains his worldview and you know, how like monsters kind of control things and they shouldn't. You know. And I think once that emotional beat connects with Max instantly. I was like, okay, all right. Uh, I think that that makes sense. Like that was that was almost that realization was almost as good of a prize <laughs> as as money would have been. Yeah. He sold me. Yeah, I would have said yes. Like, oh shit! All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, I I felt I felt two ways about it because on the one hand, it feels a little random. Um, that you know they're just getting involved. Well, that Max and 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 Jeremiah are getting involved in this. It makes sense for Jeremiah when he explains it, but um, it feels a little bit random. But at the same time, you know, giving these two individuals who, as we outlined earlier, would have been on on opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, a, a few decades ago, something to align over, I thought was really smart. And at that time frame, what else other than, you know, Nazis? I personally recently learned about the Nazi Bund, ironically, from the incoming captain america run by uh, jms and so oh. knowing that that's a real thing um allowed me to like accept it as a concept like oh shoot they're fighting nazis in new york um that made it acceptable and i will say this you put nazis in a comic book really any story i'm down for them to get killed let's see it <laughs> yeah you want to yeah. You want to send a 70-year-old dude <laughs> with a shotgun after some Nazis? Let's see it. You're just explaining the new Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> Sounds great. Did you know they, there was a whole Nazi convention in, at uh, Madison Square Garden? Yes. Yeah. Wild. Think about it. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. And I like that. Like That's cool that Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips got to show something that most people they probably open the book up right and they're like nazis in new york what the hell is this yeah like okay so go do your research now you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like here's a here's an aspect of history you don't know about it colors the story and it makes it feel almost like fiction but it's really not Mm -hmm. i thought that that was really interesting and clever i took it at face value i'm like okay if brubaker is telling me this it probably happened he's pulling from something and then I went after the fact to, to do the research to your point, but I didn't, I didn't immediately question it because I'm just like, no, he's, uh, for whatever reason, I, I trusted the, the honesty of the storytelling. Hmm. 
She was wild, dude. <laughs> I, yeah, I, quote. I, 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 yeah. I really appreciated um, the simplicity of Max's reward for that job as well. He got what he asked for. You know, he, cash. he wanted a house, a uh, house in Queens. God knows why. Because it's good. <laughs> and uh, a little bit of cash for Rosa. That's all he wanted. And Jeremiah said, no problem. And it, it makes this really interesting collision of Max's wants and needs, you know, as a character in the, through the book. Um, because he, you know, they're still book to go. Um, and so he hears about uh, the the results of the ledger. There's a, a Nazi-linked banker that gets taken out, uh, you know, on page three of the newspaper or something that he's reading one day. And he goes to congratulate Jeremiah and finds out Jeremiah has been, quote unquote, pushed down the stairs. He fell down the stairs. Allegedly, yeah. yeah. Quote unquote, yeah. fell down the stairs. Uh, and he finds out that uh, it was somebody that lived in uh, Jeremiah's building. And this is where Max's needs come in. He's got to go out in a blaze of glory. And he goes after him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he knows he's getting got to. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved about the book is the way that Brubaker sort of sets that up because way earlier when um, Max, I think it's his first heart attack when he gets beat up, the reason he gets beat up is because he's trying to stop a Jewish man from being harassed. Yep. So that carries over later to when his, you know, sort of friend is his you know compatriot in this in this uh scheme they put together for revenge um gets killed he's like nah screw that mm -hmm. i'm standing up for myself i'm standing up for my man and that and and jeremiah was standing up for jewish people if you if you're a minority you look at that scene and you don't go hey man yeah i wish i could pick up a gun you know i wish i could stand up for my people. I wish I could fight oppression and racism and violence against, you know, people who can't defend themselves. Like that was a swelling moment of the story where Max accepts that there are some things that are more important and worth sacrificing for. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of this yep. world. Anyway, I'm teaching these motherfuckers a lesson. Yep. This is not the way you live and you pay the price for wanting to live this way. I yep. liked it. I liked that a lot. And that's it. That's the book. 67 pages. Not a lot. <laughs> Was it really 67? Yep. Something Whoa. Like that. That's yeah, that's like three issues. I um yeah, I was curious barely. because I think what's what sparked all of this, even the 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 Discord discussion that made us do uh Brubaker and Phillips was their new book, uh, Night Fever, that came out in June. Um yeah. that's 120 pages. So oh, uh, fucking hell. Yeah, this seems to be almost be like a little outlier, which I enjoy. I kind of wish more teams would do this. There aren't that many teams, unfortunately. I, that, that's yeah. very fair. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we haven't uh, we haven't touched on the art really. Yeah, yeah I was going to make Marco do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there, there's there there are two separate styles yeah. that get used, and I really appreciate that usage because it looks like a wanted poster. It has these like these like grain and texture on stuff. And it's the uh, it's all done in ink and one maybe one color some it looks like watercolor wash and then the rest of it is in sort of uh, the more typical style we might think of of Phillips and it's his son right Jacob Phillips doing it that's coloring like, yeah coloring right yeah so I mean that must be uh, that's a tag team already and I I thought it was man they can't do wrong like. I can't critique anything in this thing. It's it's just all phenomenal, dude. It's two two textures, two tones, all good. The 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 I guess it's not flashback. It is it, it's flashback because it's also flashing to the pulp story, but I'll call it the flashback. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. 
that art style almost feels like um like a print printmaking marker, right? Like where it, it's oh. just it's so quite literally there's no detail. It's the lines on paper almost. Yeah. Heavy inks. Yeah. So specifically on that, um, one of the Phillips. I'm not sure who to uh, equate this to, but it's uh, I took this from the, the AIPT Pulp Process Edition review. Uh, it says that uh, in Pulp's case, this meant deploying not only two different palettes for its two time periods, but deploying them in different ways. For Max's flashbacks uh, to his days as the Red Rock Kid, Phillips turned to the texture of paint rollers. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Now that you say that, I'm looking at a random page and I feel like I see it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like yeah. almost like a, like a, like if you, you ever do um etching in school or anything like that, where you etch yeah, into like, like a, 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 like a stamp like a rubbing. Yeah. 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 Paint yeah. the wall. And like, or, um, I don't know the, it, it's like you have this like almost uh plasticky thing and you, you, you etch out of it so you can make a, a print. It's for printmaking. I forget the, oh, print, the blocks. Yeah, print blocks. Print blocks. Yeah. 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 It print almost feels like printing. that was made. And then you just, painted black over and put it on some paper like stamped on um, which i got to assume is how wanted posters were made (laughs) um especially that texture like the grain that you get yeah yeah for sure wow that's interesting and then uh uh sean phillips said about the cover um that uh, while he used the comics specific software clip studio uh, he included layers of scans for of real paper for textures. Mm. He said he liked to he likes to use to add and use those to his digital work to stop it from looking too clinical. Oh, so isn't it lying? Isn't it insane how like you know Sean Phillips put all that effort in, and you know all talented artists put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into their work, and then you like open the book and you like fucking just go r- you blow right past the pages <laughs> seconds like that's sucks. i always think about that yeah yeah like and it's it's such a it's it's why comics is such a disposable medium yeah it sucks like kirby stuff kirby books at the time we're just throwing the trash when they were done you know yeah Wild. well even even um marco you probably heard this on uh manga explaining um, I've been listening to a ton of that recently. They talk about like the history of some of the manga and uh, Christopher Butcher and Deb Aoki are two like manga scholars. Like they live in Hawaii and Japan and they, you know, really get into like the history of it. Artists just, the studios toss. just throw the art away. Yeah. Literally what? just, I mean. Original just, manga art is just tossed? Oh, like, like just the, tossed. The, the inks. Yeah. yeah. It just goes to the garbage. Yep. All of that, and this is across any publisher, any yeah. book. It's just it's at the much, thousands so lost of pages revenue. At yeah, the, the most and, and they talk about corporate that. way oh, of thinking about it. But. There was an there was an episode about that where they discuss like yeah. this would yeah. be a crazy avenue for additional money into the and one of the things that they mentioned I feel like was they need to get the rights to keep it in order to resell it or something because or something yeah it's some complicated thing where technically the artist is not the owner and so the reason they do it is so that they can't sell it and they keep whatever uh that it just it's to prevent them from making extra money or some shit insane god forbid artists get a little more uh yeah. money for their work wow that's right i forgot about that episode damn i'm gonna have to listen back yeah i honestly i totally forgot that sean phillips does digital like i'm so used to his traditional I mean, stuff like I, I don't see it until you mention it and then i can i can see it but it's all in his color. It's all in the in the colors and the lines. He does. Uh, he does have some physical stuff. Man, he did. He's, he's done. done he's done some uh, Criterion collection covers too. Oh. Um, he did one for oh, yeah. the great the Great Escape that apparently is on sale if you have fifty five hundred dollars. Um, That's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts here? Well, I I just wanted to uh, really quick say. Um, on the Sean Phillips art that yeah, please. for all the years that these two have been running together, the one thing, regardless of what you think about any of their installments, Sean Phillips 
has gotten better and better and better. He's incredibly talented. He's so good at figuring out, like, what is it that we need to get across visually in this particular panel and just nailing it. Like, whenever um, they're in the uh, – whenever they're doing the the heist and they're doing the getaway, and it's just this – this little sequence here, if you were watching us, uh, where Max begins to have a heart attack and you can see um, he's clutching his chest and he's got those gritted teeth like, oh, my yeah. God, you know, um, and the lettering credit to the lettering as well. The lettering starts to kind of blur. And that's that's what happens when he has a heart attack. Right. And it's like if you took the words out of this book, which I always think is is one of the best um, praises you can give to a, a comic book artist. If you took the words out of this book and it was just Sean and Jacob Phillips, it, it makes sense. You, you know understand exactly what's happening. Yep. And uh, I think uh, one of the other things is to that he does really well is he he builds these tense moments. Sean, do you mind flipping back uh, maybe like six, seven pages on the one you just opened? Um, there's a moment where uh, he they're just about to enter and the guy that they approach pulls out a gun on Max, and he just has a sliver of a moment that just says shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. really good beat, right? Of of you have a, an action moment at the top, you have a, a response at the bottom, and then oh, you need his, you need just a little bit of real estate to get his emotional state at the moment, and then you continue on. Yep, just just like tremendous storytelling from the art standpoint you can tell that there's absolute synergy between them yep always i thought it was interesting too just quickly how max looks like the shadow did you guys notice that <laughs> yeah especially when he had the bandana on yep. yeah that's probably deliberate right i'm sure it is yeah because that's what that's yeah he's the pulp character yeah. mm. Um, I will say uh, to your question about final thoughts that this isn't my favorite of the collaborations between Ed and Sean. Um, I think that it's a strong book. Um, if you've not read anything by them before, this is a pretty like easy in because it's short, it's brisk, it's sweet. You probably won't have the experience that I did of like, oh, I already know where all this is going because, you know, it's probably new to you. Um, so this is a great intro to what they do, but I think that they've done things that felt meatier and um, uh, connected with me more uh, throughout their, their years of collaboration. So while I would recommend it, if you're seasoned, then maybe, you know, maybe you won't get as much out of this as someone who's newer to these books will. Um, I, I Exactly what Sean said. I, I think if you are seasoned and, you are a fan this is a good uh book to read to just cover the base of all that is sean phillips and ed brubaker um i like this a lot um i think this is the most snackable of <laughs> the brubaker phillips things i think this is one that you can easily like give to somebody who maybe doesn't really read these like who thinks maybe comics are Batman, Spider Man. I feel like this is a yeah. good one. To be like, no, no, no. There's, there's more to to, to what you can read. Uh, maybe even like a good uh, introductory uh, for Baker Phillips book too. Like, I would not yeah. give Fatal to someone right away. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, fade out even could be a little, little dense. Like, this is like to the point. Um, especially if they like Breaking Bad. That that ending is very feels very similar. Uh, mm. to the end of Breaking Bad. So. The show you've seen, right? I've seen the end. Oh God, you're yeah. are you so, one of those? I that saw the first season the and I saw the last episode. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah, this is an easy recommend. I think it's great. Nice brisk, you know, half hour, forty five minute read. You'll have a great time. Pull. Easy pull. <laughs> now, if you like this. There's plenty more I came from. We have a book club on just about every major comic that's out there. And dang it, if we don't, you should join our Discord and tell us. And then 
get on Patreon and make us read it. <laughs> That's patreon.com slash pals. Make sure and check us out on Pals Pulls Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern or on the main show, The Comics Pals, Saturday at 10, 15 a.m. Eastern. We're The Comics Pals saying adios, amigos. Take care, guys.